I want to do an experiment. Look at this painting. It's called Ciphers and Constellations, In Love with a Woman, made by Joanne Miro in 1941, 41 years after Nietzsche's death. This painting has nothing to do with Nietzsche, no relevance to his philosophy. What I want you to do is introspect on what this painting does to you. What do you feel and think when you see it? What it means to you, what it does to you, stimulates Nietzsche's most misunderstood, most confused metaphysical concept, the will to power. What is good? Everything that heightens the feeling of power in man, the will to power, power itself. What is bad? Everything that is born of weakness. What is happiness? The feeling that power is growing, that resistance is overcome. It's important not to connote to terminology any prevalent conceptions. The understanding must be allowed a free territory to explore. When we see the word power or weakness, we must see them in the context of the writer's work. Thomas Mann, a 20th century writer and intellectually obsessed reader of Nietzsche, once said, Anyone who takes Nietzsche at face value, literally, anyone who believes him, is lost. Power is not meant to be understood as the subjugation of one over another. This is the crucial confusion when studying Nietzsche's words. Power is an existential mode, a type of being, an excitation and execution of a particular psychology. And weakness is a reaction and betrayal of a higher nature. Frederick Nietzsche, with his focus on the body and habit and diet, was a practical philosopher, the first philosopher as instructor as a physician of cultural malaise, a wonderkind among those that sat on the comfy thrones of academia. What's not commonly known is that he was a brilliant cavalryman in the Prussian army, a highly competent and zealous soldier. He became a professor at the University of Basel at 24 with no doctorate to do so. He was multidimensionally gifted. His early life was a far cry from the sickly bookworm figure some cast him to be. Though his many sicknesses would cause him to leave the university and withdraw into a life of inactivity and solitude, which I believe is what informed his heaviest and greatest insights. But after all, and above all, it depends on who is diseased, who mad, who epileptic or paralytic, an average dull-witted man, in whose illness any intellectual or cultural aspect is non-existent, or a Nietzsche or Dostoevsky. It was Thomas Mann who first understood that the withdrawal from life and a diminishing of its powers is what gives thinkers like Nietzsche the perspective to comprehend life in the highest resolution. It is by being observers to the group strangers skirting the backdrop and never involved or affected, that we can see the forces that act on the group. Otherwise, if we are members, those forces act on us and naturally hide from us their mechanics. To understand the will to power, you have to understand the idea of force. The victorious concept, force, by means of which our physicists have created God and the world, still needs to be completed. An inner will must be ascribed to it, which I designate as will to power. Force is the actualization of a psychology. Compassion is a force. Pity is a force. Anger, jealousy, pride, courage, deception, honesty. All of these are the forces at play. Giles de Luzet, a 20th century philosopher, cuts and ruptures for us a view into the Nietzschean mind. His book, Nietzsche and Philosophy, is the clearest and most systematized account of the true meaning of the will to power. If it is true that all things reflect a state of forces, then power designates the element, 
or rather the differential relationship of forces which directly confront one another. This relationship expresses itself in the dynamic qualities of types such as affirmation and negation. Now, Deleuze, as is the feature of most French philosophers, can be very abstract and obscure with language. So I want to capture for you the essence of what I learned from him and what he learned from Nietzsche. There are two types of forces in the human psyche, active and reactive. You can also term these as affirmative or negating. Active forces heighten the power of life. Think of the thought experiment of the eternal return. It's usually posed with the moral sentiment of amor fati, love of one's fate. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more, and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Nietzsche's ideal for a fully realized human life is to be so in love with what you are, the events of your life, your becoming, that you would wish for that life to repeat eternally with no variation of circumstance. Are you horrified or joyful in the face of such possibility? That's the test of the eternal return. A test ultimately decided on the strength and variety of active forces. An individual who lives according to active, life-affirming forces will choose without fear for them to experience their life from birth to death eternally. Only active forces can eternally keep going. Reactive forces wither and die through the repetition. Reactive forces include resentment, bad conscience, pity, and all the sentiments that degrade the fruitful and life-affirmative nature of becoming. The two great human reactive concepts, as diagnosed by Nietzsche, are those of resentment and bad conscience, expressions of the triumph of reactive forces in man and even of the constitution of man by reactive forces. Life is a battlefield of forces. While the reactive can at times triumph, they eventually succumb to nihilism, the total denigration of life. For Nietzsche, the reactive forces are embodied in their totality within the Christian religion, the harbinger of nihilism. Christianity, by being comprised of reactive forces, contained the tools of execution that would kill the god it worshipped. Nietzsche viewed the death of the Christian god as a tragedy. Man would now have to put themselves at the center of the universe. The massive spilling of god blood will have to nourish the growth of a new human being, one whose values are now a mirror, reflected back into themselves and nothing higher. This is the overman, a higher type of human with a psychology purely comprised of active forces. The overman is a being transfixed to becoming, the struggle of continual progression into higher, ever more life-affirmative existences. The will to power, a will surging through all of biology, is the element which selects the forces. That means, and when considering the overman, the will to power can be tuned and trained to select what is most vital and flourishing for the organism. With this understanding, we see Nietzsche was truly obsessed with self-development and answering the question of how to live better. Freud finds a counterpart in Nietzsche when Nietzsche says the psyche is a multiplicity of forces, many different psychologies that try to dominate the being that engenders them. Whenever one force wins the battle, it necessarily establishes a dominion over all the other forces. Therefore, that reigning force dominates. It does so through the will to power, the will which selects and expresses it into reality. Now, we begin to realize that the will to power is both origin and fate, beginning and end. It is the metaphysical god the hidden entity 
that bursts and orchestrates and destroys all of creation. Simply, every thought and act is an expression of the will to power, for every thought and act is rooted in a force which has been made victor by the will to power. So we know every human has the capacity to express all the varying forces, all the good and bad. What Nietzsche sought to explain is why exactly one force becomes expressed over another. In practical terms, this has to do with many factors, culture, instinct, habit, education, diet even. When Schopenhauer claimed life as being a negative, a pointless theater of pain, Nietzsche positioned himself to a higher perspective, examining Schopenhauer's life to find the hidden engine of his brain that moved his hands to write such a claim, that motioned his lips to even speak it. In the beginning, when I presented to you the painting and asked what it did for you, I'm merely exposing you to a stimulus which unleashes a force in your psyche. The force that is brought to your consciousness, either that psychological pull of curiosity or boredom or like or dislike, was brought to you by your will to power. A will that is either fine-tuned to see something inspirational, interesting or meaningful, or worthless and dull. Either engagements of the painting are expressions of the will to power, although some are fruitless while others are fruitful. A will to nothingness, an aversion to life, a rebellion against the most fundamental presuppositions of life, but it is and remains a will. This is something so crucial to Nietzsche's philosophy because this is fundamentally his antidote to nihilism, the right positioning of yourself and picking of sides among the forces clashing in your head. The will to power can either be directed to nihilism or to life. How it directs you, what forces it inspires, is the project that Nietzsche imposes us to consider, the most important project of your life, your greatest self-becoming.